Hi, Grade Twelves. Welcome to today's video. We're looking at question number seven. Um, I think we've got one, two, three more to go. Okay. Um, so question seven deals with social implications. So let's jump in because this is this is a ten mark question. So it's going to be uh, fairly quick. Seven point one says communicating via email has become the norm for society at large. We know that. Okay, that's a given. But 7.1.1 says the following. Give two indications that an email has been received, right? And that as it's been received, it may possibly be a phishing attempt. Now, what is phishing? Remember, phishing is where somebody is trying to bait you. They are trying to get information out of you by giving you something false. So it might be an email that looks like it's from a bank, but it doesn't have a landline number. It doesn't have proper headers. Um, the language usage isn't good as well. Let's see what the memo has to say. 7.1.1, an email address looks suspicious. So, for example, I had one um, that was supposed to have come from MWeb. But when I look at the email that it came from, it was at gmail.com. Now, MWeb doesn't send at gmail.com uh, emails. So already I knew. Maybe there's a strange domain name, which is anything after the at. Okay. Um, it would ask you to follow a link. So they'll tell you, man, they need you to reset your password or your details. Click on the link and it'll take you to where you need to do that. Okay, don't follow that. It might ask you to give per, uh, personal information and the email itself might have a lot of errors. 7.1.2. Give one possible reason as to why your email program is set to block.exe files. Very simple because that might be uh, what picks it up as a virus okay most viruses a lot of viruses end with .exe so when the email sees that it says no man this is some executable file this doesn't look right okay has to be some sort of a virus and it blocks it 7.1.3 give two types of theft that can be committed with the aid of computers now stop apart from the theft of hardware and data or intellectual property so we, we are excluding that so what else can you do with computers um, relating to theft that can be com committed with the aid of computers. So they mentioned things like, and I know some of you are responsible. I know some of you are, <laughs> okay, just admit your guilt, okay. Bandwidth theft, that's stealing data. Mm. You know when you stand on the corner of a street because you know that Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so have a Wi-Fi zone that extends into the street. They don't have a password. And so you stand in there basically stealing data. That's bandwidth theft. <laughs> okay. That's computer theft. Right. Or theft using computers. So bandwidth is one of them. Identity theft. Processing time and power. In other words, you are, you know, even when you are at work, um, for those of us who are, who are working and you're using the company's resources to do your own personal stuff, that's out of the question. Maybe you're dealing with copyrighted material, right? Um, you're into money laundering, all the, yeah, okay, I know some of the stuff is not relevant, but, or not relevant to you, but these are just some of the examples they mentioned. For me, just use the example of bandwidth theft and identity theft. Those basically cover um, everything you need to know. And like I've always said to you, you just need to know at least two advantages and disadvantages. 7.2, the geotagging function of modern cameras. So what is geotagging? Um, when you take a picture and you, you have this feature turned on, it means that it can actually indicate where you are, you know, and the date and time that the photo was taken. So this is a function of modern cameras and is useful for holiday makers and tourists. Explain what this statement means by explaining what geotagging is. Hmm. I think we just did. Okay. But let's look at what the memo says. Geotagging refers to and including the position, right? In other words, the GPS coordinates where you are. So you're taking the picture and it picks up. You are at this longitude and this latitude, right? That's fine. Of where the photo was taken um, in the metadata. So it's not going to appear on your screen. But when you look at the properties of that particular photo, you'll see the date and time and the location that it was actually taken at. So somebody who is going on holiday can take a whole bunch of pictures. And then when they get home, they can go through this and actually sort out um, which photos were taken on which day and at which location. 7.3. 
give two potential disadvantages of e-learning when compared to the traditional classroom approach, excluding any cost factors. Now, this is fairly simple because um, many learners, and I'm going to be very honest with you, many learners can learn from home. And when we talk about e-learning, we talk about, you know, online classes, whether it's using Google Classroom, whether it's using Zoom lessons, you know, Microsoft Teams, whatever the case is, anything that's done over the internet. Now, for some learners, that works brilliantly. For others, not so much. And we are not all the same. We cannot, no one can expect us to learn in exactly the same way. So for me, if I had to look at this and I had to answer this, I would say, well, number one, you could actually fade into the background by just being part of a Zoom class and switching your camera off. Number two, you might not get that personal touch unless the person is doing like a one-on-one -on -one lesson with you. Um, you can have internet connectivity problems. You can have sound problems, you know, anything like that. Um, you can even have problems, and the memo mentions this, problems with people being able to connect. Maybe the person doesn't have data. Maybe they don't have a laptop. Maybe they don't know how to use it. Maybe they don't know how to connect. So all of those are just some of the disadvantages um, that they mention. I think I've basically covered everything. Oh, and the last one that they mention here, health-related concerns. From sitting in front of Zoom meetings for, you know, hours at an end. So that can also um, contribute to some of the disadvantages. Then the last one, 7.4, give one indication that the message you've received is a hoax. Again, when the contents are, it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is. When the requests have been forwarded to you and like a hundred other people, <laughs> same story. It could be difficult to verify the contents of the email. So the email contains info and telling you, you know, you've, you've won this, but there's no, you know, like sort of proper uh, contact details, office um, uh, addresses, you know, anything like that. And sometimes even the content, maybe it's an SMS, it's like highly emotional content, you know, your relative died and they've left you a million dollars and, you know, you, you, you need to claim this ASAP because otherwise the government is going to take this away and you won't have access to this and your relative left it just for you. No, no, they didn't. Okay, so any one uh, of these reasons would suffice. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it for question number seven. Quick and easy 10 marks. You can see it's just dealing with day-to-day -day things um, and that's why it's under the heading of social implications. Thanks so much for joining me and I'm going to see you in question eight.